in waste utilization, uh, surely in Quebec, but as well in uh, Canada. Uh, we never met in person, I think, but we had the I had the chance to see what uh, Professor Vanicote was doing uh, on different social media, such as LinkedIn. So I'm following her and I'm a big fan. So pretty happy to have her uh, talk, talk to us here what she's doing in the University of Laval. Uh, just briefly on to introduce our speaker, she has a bachelor in bioengineering from uh, Ghent, the University of Ghent in Belgium, same for master, uh, also from the University of Ghent and also a PhD, but uh, another PhD was made at the University of Laval in uh, uh, 2015. So uh, Professor Vanicote is uh, in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Laval. Uh, she's the director of the bioengine team, and she works on um, process engineering, uh, especially on biorefinery and the green processes. So for people at the BTL, she's working on subjects that are quite comparable to what we're doing here. So it's really pertinent to have her talk to us. Uh, so I think without further ado, I will leave the floor to our uh, presenter. So Professor Venicote, thank you again for being with us. And the floor is yours. So uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here today. So I hope you can hear me well with, um, without my uh, microphone now. Um, is it uh, okay? Yes, yes it's fine. Okay, it's fine. okay good. So um, I'm going to present to you today. Uh, so the presentation is entitled Ways to Bioproducts Innovation, Powering a Circular Economy. Uh, so this is, will mainly actually cover our uh, research activities uh, in the bioengine research team uh, on green process engineering and biorefineries. Uh, so um, I'm uh, Céline Vanico, so uh, thank you for the introduction as well. So I'm uh, originally from Belgium, uh, from where uh, the difficult name. Uh, and uh, I hold the Canada Research Chair on Resource Recovery and Bioproducts Engineering. So I will explain in this presentation basically what that uh, involves. Um, so first of all, the outline of the presentation. So basically it's very, uh, very simple. So we will start with uh, who we are uh, and then uh, I will focus on some research recovery technology innovations. So basically um, the research that is ongoing uh, in our team at the moment. Uh, so uh, if there are any questions uh, afterwards, I will definitely uh, go into further detail because maybe there are people um, uh, with a different um, um, kind of knowledge uh, here in the, in the group. So if there um, uh, were things that uh, uh, were not clear, don't hesitate to ask me or to write me later on uh, as well. Uh, and we will finalize with a short take home message. Uh, so first of all, who are we? Uh, so we are the bioengine research team, as I said, um, so uh, on green process engineering and biorefineries so, uh, located at, La sorry? Let me talk Maricelli Martinez. So, okay, <laughs> so uh, we are located uh, in, uh, uh, at Quebec University, uh, at Laval University in Quebec, uh, in the chemical engineering department, and now we are uh, 17 researchers, uh, so mainly PhD students, master students, uh, and a postdoc as well, um, and as already uh, was mentioned, so we are active on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook as well, uh, so if you want to follow our activities, uh, don't hesitate uh, to follow us there. Um, so our research activities in general are um, focused, so this is very general, but on uh, environmental technologies, uh, so more uh, particularly in, uh, on resource recovery and recycling. So if you talk about resources here, uh, we talk about energy, but also nutrients uh, and also water, uh, so that we can uh, recover and recycle mainly from uh, bio-waste and also from wastewater sources. Uh, now we're going to transform these products uh, into, well, these resources uh, into bioproducts such as bioenergy, but also biosourced chemical products. Uh, we talk about fertilizers, for example, here. Um, and we don't only do experimental work, but we also do modeling uh, and optimization uh, to make these processes more green and more sustainable. Uh, so which means that we focus really on uh, reducing the energy consumption, also reducing uh, the consumption of chemicals. Uh, and as you will see throughout the presentation as well, uh, we work a lot with industry and municipalities. So our research is mainly applied research. Uh, and therefore, we also produce decision support tools, uh, which are basically software tools uh, that can be used uh, by our uh, partners basically to make uh, optimal decisions. 
so I will give some examples throughout the presentation later on of all of this. Uh, but uh, the main process that I wanted to introduce already is one of our uh, key activities at the moment, and I think also uh, of your research group, uh, so it's uh, focused on anaerobic digestion. So this is one of the processes we work on, uh, a very nice uh, example of, uh, of resource recovery, basically, uh, where we're going to transform all kinds of uh, organic waste, uh, such as uh, food waste, but also switch sludge uh, or also uh, animal manure, uh, so we can treat through anaerobic digestion. Uh, so for those who don't know uh, the technology, so it's basically um, so uh, a fermentation uh, in, a, in, an, in an anaerobic, so in a closed reaction, so without oxygen, uh, where the microorganisms that are that work there, so it's a biological process, they will transform uh, the organic material uh, into biogas. Uh, and what remains is uh, what we call the digest state. Um, so uh, the biogas can then be valorized. Uh, so it's mainly composed of methane and uh, that can be uh, either injected in a natural gas grid, uh, or we can also uh, transform it into um, electricity, heat. Uh, we can also even transform it into biofuel. So it's a source of bioenergy. Uh, and uh, what is left is what we call the digest state, and there uh, we can extract uh, all kinds of other uh, interesting bioproducts, uh, so for example, biofertilizers. And this is a research area, so I'm introducing this process because this is a research area uh, in which my uh, my team is, um, is highly active. It's actually the extraction uh, of nutrients uh, from uh, these digest states, and also these technologies can then be applied also on other uh, nutrient-rich uh, waste sources, for example, on uh, on animal manure or on, or on urine uh, or other, um, uh, other nutrient-rich waste sources. Um, so uh, if we talk about, um, well, bioproducts, chemical bioproducts, so I already introduced a little bit uh, the, the fertilizer concept, but we can actually um, extract uh, nutrients and, and carbon and other resources uh, to make uh, all kinds of bioproducts. Uh, so here I give a couple of examples. So um, so here uh, on the uh, on the bottom left we have a a biofertilizer, a granulated biofertilizer that we can make. Uh, we can also make a liquid biofertilizer, and both of these products could replace actually uh, synthetic fertilizers that are uh, used nowadays. Uh, we can also produce, for example, algae. Uh, so uh, on uh, these um, nutrient-rich uh, wastewaters or on digest state, uh, and this algae can then be transformed, for example, into a biofuel, or uh, we could also use it as feed uh, for um, for uh, animals, and uh, also even um, transform it, um, basically, well, use it as a fertilizer as well. Um, we have uh, here uh, on the top, this is actually a biodetergent uh, that is uh, extracted from, um, from digestate as well. Uh, so we can make biodetergents. Uh, we already talked a little bit about renewable gas. Uh, and then here on the top on the left, uh, this is a, a new research perspective that we are developing at the moment. Uh, it is to extract actually phosphorus uh, for um, uh, inclusion in uh, lithium ion batteries for electrical vehicles. So we're now uh, in contact with Tesla to develop um, this strategy of, 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 of phosphorus extraction from waste um, to develop more sustainable um, electrical uh, vehicle batteries. Uh, so uh, these are just uh, some kind of uh, products that uh, that we can produce, but all to say that uh, these resources are valuable resources. They are currently considered often as waste, but we can do uh, much more with it, and uh, so we should uh, extract it and valorize it. Uh, so our methodology, so um, um, uh, briefly, so we don't uh, only do experimental work. Uh, so uh, here you see a picture, for example, lab experiments, but we do also a lot of uh, pilot scale and even full scale experimental work. Uh, but as I mentioned in the beginning, we also do modeling work. And basically there's a very nice interaction between both uh, because we can use uh, the experimental data to feed our models, so to calibrate them, to validate them. Uh, but on the other hand, also uh, when we are modeling, then we learn about the process, we learn about the product quality, uh, and we can improve the process Process then. So we can back based on our uh, modeling knowledge, we go back to the experimental work and then we, uh, we design our experiments uh, accordingly to what we uh, want to study or what we want to know more about. Uh, so basically the whole goal is to develop uh, new uh, resource recovery processes uh, and also to optimize them uh, and all of this uh, with focus on the bioproduct quality. 
so this is something uh, I, I emphasize here, bioproduct quality, because this is something that in the past uh, we often uh, neglected. Uh, so uh, oftentimes, for example, in wastewater treatment, uh, we uh, we treat um, the, the wastewater. We want to remove the nutrients. We want to get rid of it. We want to get uh, rid of the waste as well. Uh, but uh, we don't uh, we don't focus on uh, really the production of marketable end products. And so this is here uh, the goal in our research team. Uh, now, basically, our approach. Uh, so, our approach can be seen as a quality by design approach. And what do I mean with that? Uh, so this is basically an approach that is adopted from the uh, from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, in which also the product quality is of high importance. So uh, basically, we start uh, with the target product profile, uh, and then we're gonna design the product and try to understand the product quality. Uh, to then uh, basically develop the process uh, and develop understanding to basically produce that product. Uh, and then very important here is optimization and control. So we basically want to reach, <clears throat> I have something in my throat, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Oh God. I just had lunch before, so it's like something in my throat. Okay, good. Uh, so basically, we uh, we're gonna um, based on the product that we. So so basically, what I want to explain is uh, that we're gonna um, design the product, try to understand the product, and then we develop modeling tools to basically uh, design our process and uh, to see the impact of the uh, process variables, basically the operational parameters on the product quality. So as such, we can basically uh, optimize the process uh, based with uh, all the time with a, with a um, product quality in mind and uh, develop control strategies basically to continuously reach uh, the product quality that we target. Uh, so this involves a lot of modeling. So that's why we use the model so we can really see uh, what is the impact uh, of a change in operational settings on our product quality. Uh, and we also use, uh, so once uh, the, the process is implemented, once it is in place, uh, then we will We'll use uh, monitoring strategies basically to um, um, to to really follow up. Uh, so if we change a process setting, then what is the impact on our uh, on our product quality? Uh, so uh, then, uh, of course, uh, a risk assessment is very important uh, in this kind of um, um, resource recovery uh, cycle um, because we need to assure uh, the the quality as well. So uh, exactly as we do in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, for example, uh, where a consistent product quality is really important. Uh, also here, if you want to market, for example, a fertilizer, then a consistent product quality is really important uh, to be able to market it because uh, also farmers, they don't take uh, whatever uh, uh, whatever uh, they are given. Uh, they really want to know that the product works because they don't want to use, of course, uh, they, they don't want to lose uh, their um, their. their um, their plant yield, so their uh, their production. So uh, they want uh, the, the same uh, harvest as they usually do. Uh, so all of this, uh, uh, of course, a continuous imp improvement is important. Um, so uh, once a process is implemented, so we're going to follow up the product quality. Uh, and then with the modeling tools, we're going to continuously see if we can uh, optimize the process further and uh, um, uh, improve uh, basically the uh, the process to really uh, adapt it to the, the needs of uh, um, um, yeah, of the, the, the industry or uh, the municipality in place. Um, so if we look uh, at our lab, uh, so um, here on the top, so I was talking about monitoring. So here on the top, uh, we see, for example, um, a, a monitoring system uh, that we uh, can put in place. Uh, we have here uh, also, so uh, this is basically the monitoring system the, the, uh, that we have. Uh, so it is now in the lab, as you see, because of COVID restrictions. Uh, but uh, here we see, for example, a pilot with which we can uh, do phosphorus recovery. Uh, and so um, in the, with this uh, system, we really get uh, the data online. So we don't need to be there, but we uh, we can get continuously. We can measure the data and we get them uh, on our computer at home. Um, then, uh, so this is for monitoring uh, uh, at full scale. What we what we do uh, basically to collect data uh, to feed our models, for example. 
Uh, here on the bottom, then, we see uh, some anaerobic digestion units that we have in the lab. So uh, this is a semi-continuous anaerobic digestion uh, digester here, and this is um, a, a batch uh, system which, 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 which we can uh, basically determine the maximum uh, biomethane potential uh, or the maximum production of methane that we can have uh, from a certain waste source. And then here, this is an example. So I'm just showing here some examples of equipment that we have in our lab. It's, of course, not everything. Uh, but this is an example of a technology uh, that allows uh, really to optimize the product quality. So as I said before, uh, for us, product quality is very important because we want to market the product thereafter or our partners want to market the product thereafter. Uh, so um, uh, because it's, we want it to be reused, of course. Uh, and this here is, for example, a fluid bed granulator uh, with which we can make, for example, uh, um, um, we can make co-things, uh, for example, if you want to produce a fertilizer, you can put on um, a specific co-thing uh, or a specific, uh, can reach a specific particular uh, particle size. Um, um, so all things like that we can uh, we can do with this kind of uh, equipment to really need to really um, meet basically the, the needs uh, of our partners. Uh, now, this was um, uh, basically uh, an overview of, of, of what we do, our, uh, our main area of activities. Uh, then if we look at some uh, specific uh, technology innovations in our team here, um, then first of all, um, we can uh, have a look at the uh, production of um, basically some new bioproducts, as I mentioned before, uh, using a technology that we call um, um, nano-enhanced adsorptive um, ion exchange. Uh, so this is basically a technology that we use for phosphorus recovery. Um, and what we see here, for instance, um, so um, if you have a wastewater that is rich in phosphorus, uh, as, as coming in here, for instance, this is a, um, a, a phosphorus-rich wastewater, then we can have um, a column. Here, here of course, uh, we just see our lab scale column, but, um, but we have also a pilot. So the little pilot that I showed before uh, is a pilot that we can install at full scale. Uh, and so here, uh, what we do is basically on uh, a resin uh, in which we impregnated iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, that resin will basically specifically uh, absorb the phosphate from the wastewater. Uh, so this is interesting because once the column, uh, once the resin material is saturated, uh, then we basically regenerate the column and we capture the phosphorus uh, either as a liquid fertilizer, as you can see here. Uh, so we can recover it in a, in a pure form. So this is just an, a, an example here. Uh, but also, for example, we could um, uh, extract the phosphorus thereafter. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, the goal uh, in the future would be um, to, to look if we can um, um, recover it uh, and precipitate it basically to include uh, in uh, lithium ion batteries uh, thereafter. Um, so this is uh, one of the technologies so in which we uh, can recover phosphorus even at very low concentrations. So it can be used uh, to uh, treat wastewater or to treat um, 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 yeah, liquid digestate as well. Um, but uh, for example, it could also be installed uh, to treat lakes that are polluted. And that is why uh, we were with this technology also finalists of the George Party Water Prize, uh, which was basically to, um, uh, to find actually um, uh, uh, phosphorus recovery technology uh, that, uh, uh, well, removal and recovery uh, that can be used uh, to treat the Everglades. So for those who uh, have already been to the south of the US, so there's the Everglades as the park, the national park with uh, the crocodiles. And so it's very polluted because of phosphorus um, um, uh, in, in there. Uh, so, um, so this is one of the technologies that was uh, among the finalists, uh, and we have also been working on a, a provisional patent uh, uh, for this. So there's uh, further developments going on in our team now to um, to uh, basically improve the regeneration because that is uh, uh, the main cost, uh, and so we are improving, uh, we are developing new strategies to regenerate it um, um, uh, in a more efficient way, even. Um, then another technology uh, is uh, stripping and scrubbing for nitrogen recovery. Uh, so basically, uh, if you have a nitrogen-rich wastewater or waste source, uh, so or a liquid digestate, for example, uh, then in a first uh, column, so here I'm showing the lab scale uh, setup, but in uh, in uh, in reality, so at full scale, this would be two uh, two columns. So you would have a stripping column and an absorption column. Uh, and so in the stripping column, we have an air inlet uh, where we're going to basically bubble air throughout uh, the, 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 the liquid waste source. Uh, and that uh, if we uh, if it's um, 
uh, an alkaline base source, so it's a, uh, has a high alkalinity, then uh, basically uh, the pH will naturally increase if we strip in air because uh, actually CO2 will, uh, will volatilize. And so the pH increase, which means uh, that uh, ammonium in the liquid waste source will transform into ammonia. And so we get actually ammonia in the air and the airflow. And in a second column, uh, we can then capture that ammonia in the airflow uh, in an acidic scrubber. Uh, and here in this acidic scrubber, so typically we use sulfuric acid uh, to actually absorb the ammonia again. Uh, so then we can basically produce ammonium sulfate, uh, so um, which has a high fertilizer value. So uh, um, ammonium sulfate is one of the uh, fertilizers that's most used in the world actually for uh, as a nitrogen source. Um, for crop growth. Uh, so we compared this product also uh, at, in greenhouse trials uh, with other uh, synthetic fertilizers, so to compare the performance. Uh, and we see that it's, um, it's uh, equal or even better, actually, uh, the performance of this product. Uh, now, because uh, you may think, um, well, sulfuric acid, it is a, a dangerous product and we don't want to use it. Uh, for example, in small municipalities, even uh, you cannot use it. It's not, uh, you, it's not authorized. Uh, so that is why we did tests also with other acids, for example, citric acid and uh, acetic acid. Uh, and basically with citric acid, which is an organic acid uh, and would actually be in, in, uh, allowed to also in, a, uh, in organic farming then. Um, so... Um, so uh, with this asset, we obtained the same uh, performance actually to produce ammonium citrate. Uh, and uh, the ammonium citrate for crop growth also showed actually interesting advantages uh, as compared to the ammonium sulfate. So it is also an interesting and valuable fertilizer uh, that can become of interest in the future, definitely for uh, basically small municipalities that want to recover their nitrogen uh, or um, yeah, small digestion plants and things like that. Um, Following that, um, so another project that we have been working on uh, and still work on actually is, um, is the production of biochar. Uh, so we can uh, produce biochar, uh, in our case we produce it from biosolids, and this is a, a big project that we have now ongoing uh, with Energia, which is a company that is located in Ontario. Um, so uh, at the moment we are building a demonstration plant uh, for um, um, uh, that is called the pyrobiometing process. So basically it's a pyrolysis process that we apply uh, on the uh, solid fraction of the digestate. So um, the digestate that comes from anaerobic digestion of uh, sewage sludge, basically. Um, so um, here we look mainly at uh, the valorization of the biochar, so um, what happens throughout the process with the micropollutants. So uh, we follow the nutrients, but in this case we also follow uh, the micropollutants, emerging contaminants and so on, uh, because uh, that is becoming an increasing concern as well. So uh, that is why sometimes, uh, definitely in the US now, the, 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 the uh, pyrolysis of bio, uh, of, of basically of digestate becomes uh, of interest. Uh, Definitely, if it comes from switch sludge, so to um, to really remove the pharmaceuticals and things like that. Um, so we look then uh, what can we do with the biochar as well. Uh, so we did um, well, we did test in the lab to upgrade the quality, but we also did some uh, greenhouse and now also field trials with uh, these products to see uh, what is the value of these biochars. And we compare it basically with switch sludge, with raw switch sludge, uh, but also with digestate and also with compost, for instance. So um, another uh, pro uh, project, so um, in, 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 same, in the same ID, so if we want to upgrade the digestate quality, uh, because it's all about uh, quality, so we want uh, ideally to have a revenue uh, for it if we want to, um, uh, to sell a product. Uh, so here we are, um, we have different kind of technologies basically in our lab um, so uh, to upgrade these uh, digestates. So here on top uh, you basically see a, a composting unit, uh, but it can also be used basically for what we call uh, just uh, aerobic conditioning. So just a little bit of aeration to stabilize further the, the digestates. Um, here we have uh, three stage anaerobic digestures. Uh, so we can actually, it's very, um, uh, we can actually, they are very flexible. We can actually uh, also uh, only have two stages uh, or, or just one stage. But uh, if we have the three stage, then we could do, for example, uh, a post treatment of the digestate as well. For instance, a thermophilic treatment uh, to kill off any pathogens or so uh, to meet really uh, the requirements that we want to meet. Um, so um, depending on what is the end use. Um, 
And then here, uh, as I already mentioned, so this is our fluid bed granulator in which we can upgrade uh, the digestate, for example, granulate them or um, um, even coat them with certain, um, with certain um, yeah, um, liquids that we want. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, so we also do uh, field and greenhouse trials uh, using these bio-based fertilizer products. But of course, we are in the chemical engineering department now, so we work for that uh, with the uh, agronomics department at the uh, University Laval. Uh, and so uh, they have uh, access to uh, to fields, they have access to greenhouses, and so we have uh, some joint uh, students that um, have been working so on all kinds of um, um, comparisons uh, between uh, bio-based fertilizer products and then synthetic products and. Uh, um, as you see here, well, in the publications, uh, and this is also um, of my, my my own PhD. This was also part of it uh, to follow up uh, the the, the uh, really the performance of these uh, fertilizer products in the fields. Uh, and if we then look uh, so uh, a little bit at the at the modeling side, so and now we really uh, mainly talked about uh, experimental work. Uh, now, if you look at some uh, modeling, so I'm not going to go into the details, but I just want to give an idea of um, uh, what we uh, are working on, what we um, uh, have been doing. Um, so um, a, a big project now, and this is a, an issue uh, for a lot of uh, uh, anaerobic digestion plants in Quebec at the moment, uh, is um, the, the co-digestion. Uh, so um, um, anaerobic digestion, normally, well, if you can do it, a, a monodigestion, what we call, so that is only one uh, waste stream, but oftentimes, it is more interesting to combine it with other waste streams, uh, basically to create some synergies. Uh, so it's the same like, for example, if we eat, uh, if we only eat sugars, it wouldn't be good for us. So we really want a mix of sugar, protein, lipids and things like that. Uh, so uh, an optimal balance. So that is the same basically in uh, an anaerobic digester. Uh, so that is why we're going to combine different waste flows. Uh, and uh, so uh, it is not always easy to, um, um, to determine like uh, what waste flows we're going to combine in what ratio uh, and that is why a modeling tool is very um, very useful for that uh, so based on a, a lot of data sets that we have so we are now developing this uh, co-digestion tool uh, that can then be used uh, so this is in collaboration with Quebec City uh, that can then be used basically for uh, for optimization of uh, the, the, the co-digestion uh, ratios uh, in the plant and what waste sources they need to to add. Uh, so, and throughout the years, we have been developing uh, all kinds of uh, models. So here uh, is what we call the NRR, NRM library. So this is a nutrient recovery model library that we call, that we implemented in a, a software tool um, that is used in wastewater treatment mainly, but uh, it is also now available in MATLAB. Uh, and so we have uh, an anaerobic digestion model, uh, we have a precipitation model, uh, so for uh, phosphorus recovery basically, uh, and then we have uh, here for instance a stripping and a scrubbing mod model for nitrogen recovery. Um, so basically for each of the technologies that we work on, we try to uh, develop a model in the same uh, in the same line. And, and the goal uh, of that is basically so that we are able thereafter uh, to couple the different models together to really uh, simulate the complete uh, treatment train for, uh, for resource recovery. So for energy and nutrient recovery. Uh, and what is the advantage of that? Well, it is that um, uh, often operational uh, choices upstream can influence basically the um, the choice that you will make uh, more downstream. Uh, so, for example, here uh, the, the 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 waste sources that you would choose for uh, for co-digestion, uh, it can impact and uh, thereafter, of course, your digestate quality uh, and also what processes for nutrient recovery thereafter that you would implement then. Uh, so all of this is uh, is basically it hangs a little bit uh, together. So there are a lot of interactions. Uh, and if you want to improve, basically, if you want to optimize the overall performance of the treatment train, so uh, really uh, reduce, for example, the chemical requirements, then it's very interesting to basically uh, be able to model them together and to see uh, what process do I want to put first, what process do I want to put uh, thereafter, and so on, uh, to really limit um, the, 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 the use of energy and the use of uh, chemical products as well. Uh, and then in that same line, uh, so uh, a final project that I wanted to, to show you today uh, is uh, the development of a holistic decision support software tool for organic waste valorization, uh, which is called Optimo. So we have here uh, a website that is already available uh, where you can have a look if you want to uh, learn a bit more uh, about the project. But it's a big project uh, with the Quebec government, uh, also municipalities and industry that are involved. Uh, and basically here, so we go a little bit larger. Uh, so uh, we 
don't only look at the process performance, uh, so uh, in terms of the technical performance, but we also want to reduce the greenhouse gases, uh, the costs, the social impact, uh, all while uh, respecting the regulations. So it's really uh, a big uh, decision support tool, let's say, or an advanced decision support system. So uh, it also requires a, a large research group, uh, which I will show later. Uh, but um, but the goal is so to not only simulate the waste treatment process, uh, but also the collection of the waste material, then the transport of the waste to the waste treatment plant, uh, and then the transport of the products that are produced to uh, the, uh, the the seat where, where they will be uh, used then. Uh, so um, so throughout the way, so we're going to uh, improve the technical performance, uh, so the, the roads, uh, so the road network, so which, uh, which way uh, to go, uh, so the costs and all that respect regulations as I mentioned before so we work for this together uh, with experts in uh, geomatics so at the uh, University of Laval but also uh, economics and then uh, also somebody from the from the agronomics department so for the uh, for the agricultural uh, agricultural regulations and things like that. Um, so basically, uh, here what we do is uh, the models that we have developed already, uh, we couple them to a multidimensional spatiotemporal database. So that's a little bit the uh, geometrics language, but uh, uh, but here uh, what I mean is that uh, uh, also um, so um, it's, it's basically an advanced geographical information system where you can also include cost data and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, things like that, all kind of factors, uh, so that we can optimize them all together. So if we choose an optimal road network for example, uh, to transport the materials, then we will take into account the greenhouse gases, the costs, uh, and also the social impact. So we don't want to put well transport a truck of digestate, for example, uh, through uh, the the, the Vieux Quebec. Uh, so um, so um, so that uh, we'll take it all into account. And then, uh, so a user interface is now being developed, uh, basically, uh, and um, we can then optimize, so the user is able to optimize situations, but also to do just uh, scenario analysis uh, himself. Uh, and then you will see also as an output, we can also have uh, maps and all kind of um, uh, figures that uh, can be uh, produced as an output. Uh, so in terms of spatiotemporal analysis, for example, what we are looking now uh, at the moment, so we are doing a couple of case studies, uh, for example, uh, for recovery and distribution. So uh, if this would be here in point A, uh, an anaerobic digestion site, uh, then uh, I mean we can simulate: uh, is it more interesting to distribute your end product in point B, uh, or is it more interesting to distribute it in point C? So for example, if it would be uh, a fertilizer, uh, so then it takes into account also, for instance, the fossil for a saturation status of these soils. Um, so uh, because we wouldn't uh, want to apply a very phosphorus rich fertilizer on a field that is already very phosphorus rich. So there are restrictions there as well. Uh, so the TOS software tool will take uh, all of that into account as well. Uh, then we can also do best location analysis. For example, if you want to install a new plant, a uh, new anaerobic digestion plant, or even a new composting plant, uh, so we can see is it more of interest to put it here, um, so uh, or, or here, for instance. Uh, so taking into account the waste materials that we have in the area, so that we can use as an input to the process, uh, but also the, um, the 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 markets for the end products that we have in the area. So all to reduce basically the transport. Uh, and then we can also do comparisons of over time. So what I mean here is, for example, um, so um, the, 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 if the, we take into account, for instance, the population growth, uh, then we can will have more. Uh, for example, in 50 years, we will probably have more uh, population here, uh, and so then we can um, uh, predict what is going to happen, like if uh, the population increases with uh, that percentage, or also over the seasons, so it changes. So we eat differently uh, during summer than during winter. So that those are also uh, things. That that we can uh, consider with this tool. Uh, and so all of this uh, is to, um, uh, to to optimize basically to minimize uh, the, the CO2 emissions, so the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the transports and also the costs of the complete process uh, for waste polarization and while maximizing basically the recovery uh, of nutrients, also the recovery of energy and also of course the revenues. Uh, so we are working now on a couple of state case studies, so, um, so um, um, in the a future presentation I will be able to, to show some, some case studies results on this uh, as well. 
Uh, so, and then just uh, in a nutshell, uh, so uh, to finalize uh, some other projects that we work on, so we're a big team, so um, we have we have um, quite some projects going on at the moment. So uh, we have another PhD student that works on a new process for integrated nutrient recovery, which is basically uh, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium recovery in one uh, process that he is working on. Uh, then also we have a project on the study of the fate of viruses uh, in wastewater and sludge treatment. So this is a collaboration with H2O Innovation. So we really look at uh, the performance on membrane bioreactors and anaerobic digestion, uh, basically for uh, the removal of viruses. So this is um, uh, this uh, started in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, then we have a study. Um, so um, here, these are two studies with uh, with uh, industry, so Silanese and Cascade, uh, where we look at the valoriz valorization of their industrial sludge. Uh, so uh, the initial goal would be to use anaerobic digestion here as well. Uh, but there we see that we will need some pre-treatments basically to um, uh, to really degrade uh, that sludge. So we're, we're looking into that now. Uh, then we have uh, with Quebec City some other projects on the reduction of sulfurous production in anaerobic digestion because that um, uh, sulfur can end up in the biogas and that uh, we want to avoid that because we have uh, limits for sulfur in the biogas and so um, so um, we are looking uh, how we can uh, efficiently uh, reduce that. Uh, and also uh, we develop a, a, a generic guideline, basically, we are now doing experience uh, to see um, um, what is a, an interesting startup strategy uh, for anaerobic digestion. So often uh, when we start an anaerobic digestion, if we compare different plans and they all do it uh, differently, so there is like no generic guideline. Uh, so we have a PhD student now working on uh, really uh, to see um, what we can uh, generalize and what questions um, um, an, an anaerobic digestion plan should uh, uh, should ask him itself basically at the start. Uh, and then, um, so uh, I talked a little bit of micropollutants. So this is an area of, of, of increasing concern and of increasing interest for research as well. Uh, and then, um, Another project uh, that is a little bit um, um, further away, but uh, it's uh, still waste, but it's uh, the recovery of uh, gypsum, gypsum uh, from construction, renovation and demolition waste, uh, which is a collaboration that we have with uh, Creek uh, Investissement Quebec. Uh, and then finally, we have now a project, uh, a big project as well, that is um, on wastewater treatment and water and nutrient reuse basically in the north. So it's a project in Nunavik uh, that got approved. Uh, so where we will uh, look at the, installing uh, one of our pilots there uh, to, um, to treat basically the wastewater, um, to try to improve the wastewater treatment that they have at the moment. Uh, so as a take home message, um, so uh, and I know I gave a lot of information there, but uh, as I said before, um, uh, you can always contact me if you have uh, questions, uh, if you're interested in a particular project that you want to learn more about. Uh, but the main message is that uh, nothing is lost, uh, nothing is created, uh, everything is and uh, can be transformed. Uh, but um, numerical methods uh, are a must for optimizing the value chain. So that is why we both do experimental work and modeling work. Um, so to um, to basically, um, yeah, optimize the whole polarization chain. So uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, well, I'm uh, I'm still available now or uh, or by email as well. Thank you very thank much you very for this much. presentation. Uh, we're going to open the floor for questions. Do you have any questions? May I ask the question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very informative. So my question is related to the uh, uh, project that deals with the recovery of phosphorus from the wastewater. So my uh, my question is, first question is that uh, can we combine this technology with the conventional wastewater treatment plants? Uh, if yes, uh, do you think it can have an effect on the uh, digestion, uh, digested com uh, composition like to be used in the fertilizer? So um, yes, yeah, so um, the technology basically it can be applied in a conventional wastewater treatment plant. So um, um, so, uh, but uh, mainly as tertiary treatments because um, the technology works best basically for low uh, phosphorus concentrations uh, and also if we have uh, not too much solids, let's say. Uh, so we apply it mainly as a tertiary treatment at the moment. Uh, so. Um, um, after the secondary treatment, so after a biological system, for example. Uh, but uh, the goal is there. Uh, so what it can do is that it can, uh, for example, if the wastewater treatment plant would use uh, alum or iron, uh, iron sulfate or alum aluminum sulfate, uh, 
um, to precipitate the phosphorus upstream. Um, uh, so uh, we can basically uh, uh, remove that step. So it could reduce the um, the um, uh, the addition of iron sulfate or aluminium sulfate upstream, and we can uh, recover the phosphorus more downstream. Uh, and then uh, it doesn't really um, impact basically. So well, it could impact the if you if you remove that step. So of iron addition, in for example um, your uh, decant decanter. Um, so uh, then in your sedimentation tank, I mean, uh, then it means that there will be less phosphorus going into your sludge. And if you use then that sludge for anaerobic digestion, uh, then of course yeah, you will have less phosphorus in the in the digestate. So in that sense, it could uh, it could influence. But basically, this technology can be applied either in the wastewater treatment plant or uh, it can also be applied for liquid digestates. But after all, it doesn't really um, matter where we recover the phosphorus because in some um, cases it can be interesting to discover to recover it actually in the wastewater treatment plant instead of having it in, for example, your solid digestate. Uh, because as I mentioned uh, briefly in the presentation, but there's a lot to cover, but uh, we have a lot of phosphorus saturated areas already in Quebec. Uh, so it's often a challenge basically to, uh, to, to valorize a digestate that is very phosphorus rich. Uh, so that is uh, with, with this technology that I presented here briefly, uh, we can uh, recover phosphorus in forms uh, that could be used, for example, in horticulture or in other um, uh, industries, even where it could be um, where it could be well, um, uh, where the markets could be more interesting. Let's say. So it depends a little bit, basically, and, and, and that is what I wanted to show a little bit with the modeling as well. It is often a case-by-case -case situation, like um, uh, what is the most interesting uh, most interesting choice, basically, to make. Mm. I hope that replied to your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Julia, do you have a question? Yes. First, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. And uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, so my question is about uh, about the modeling. If it's, uh, do you guys already reach to a model that it's uh, fairly capable to predict the the profile of the products of the anaerobic digestion by maybe the the profile of the feedstock and also maybe of the the microbiota that there is in the digester or if there's like that doesn't change that much mm -hmm. so it's a good a good question basically um so anaerobic digestion models have been um, under development for for a while now so there's a um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with modeling, but there's the ADM1 model uh, it's a, uh, of the International Water Association that is pretty popular so that model contains um, uh, all the microbial reactions and uh, what we have done in the team is basically we have done improvements uh, but mainly in terms of uh, physical chemistry uh, because uh, an important aspect in an anaerobic digester is the pH and so um, the okay. conventional model um, so it did not allow to really predict the pH very well because it's not only the microbiology that is important there but also the physical chemical interactions and so what we did basically, um, so when I showed there the NRM uh, models, the nutrient recovery models, um, in, in those models we have uh, coupled a software tool that is called FreakC, uh, which is basically a, a geochemical modeling tool uh, that we coupled to uh, the biological um, the, the biological processes. And so um, then we have like uh, all the ions like um, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, nitrogen. So we have like the whole um, mixture of 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 um uh, of uh, spaces of chemical spaces basically uh, in there as well and as such we can better predict uh, the product quality so in terms of nutrients as well and their availability and things like that uh, so that is the the um um well innovation that we have there in our in our models that makes it interesting to predict the the, the product quality basically because then we can see also how much phosphorus we have in, um, uh, in, in the bioavailable form and how can we extract it, we can then um, consider later on. Thanks, great, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Uh, Camille, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I was wondering um, the, the technology for uh, nutrient recovery you talked about. You, as I understand, you're collaborating with municipalities mainly, but um, 
do you think these technologies are only adapted like to big dedicated plants or they could also be implemented in smaller uh, decentralized units like on farm digestion or something like that mm -hmm. Another interesting question. <laughs> well, um, we, we actually have, uh, and I think she's here. I saw her uh, coming in later on, but um, somewhere. But uh, we have a, a master student now working on um, uh, small-scale uh, nitrogen stripping. So where she basically works at um, uh, on the, um, um, well, she did experimental work and now uh, developing uh, adjusting the model as well to design uh, small-scale systems for, um, uh, for example, aquaculture for composting leachate treatment. Uh, for uh, urine treatment, so decentralized uh, and also um, um, well decentralized manure as well. Uh, and so um, uh, similarly, the, the phosphorus recovery technology that I talked about in the presentation. Um, so um, uh, it is a uh, it is um, made actually to 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 be able to be decentralized as well. And we're now optimizing. Uh, the regeneration strategy basically to really um, try to have actually no consumption of any chemicals uh, so that uh, it could be used uh, so I, in the northern regions or even we are looking at uh, um, in, in, in Africa and in, in developing countries as well but um, but for yeah for decentralized operations as well um, so 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 yes uh, it's it's under development let's say but it's uh, it's one of our, our current research perspectives actually to use them for a uh, for decentralized operations. Mm. Okay, thanks. Great. So, do we have any other question? Seems to be good. I think you were clear enough. <laughs> or not at all, and they don't want to ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, I would like again, uh, on behalf of the BTL, to thank you for being with us today, Professor Venecotti. Uh, you're welcome if you want to visit us eventually here in Sherbrooke. And uh, yeah, we'll yeah, stay in touch. We'll fun. follow. It would have been more fun if it was in person. <laughs> yeah, but next time you come in person and we host you here and uh, we'll show you what we're able to do on our side. It would be a pleasure. Yeah, great, great. Good. Okay, <laughs> so we'll keep in touch. We'll see you on the, on the different social media. We wish you best of luck in your work and uh, we'll probably be in contact fairly soon. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye.